Okay, I would like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olewski, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's educational webinar series, but I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. And these webinars are part of the Vasculitis Foundation's commitment to patient education. Today's webinar guest speaker is Dr. Alexandra Villaforte. And after we finish this webinar today, there will be a recorded version on the Vasculitis Foundation's YouTube channel. Everyone who registered will receive an email with a link to it as soon as it becomes available. I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today. Dr. Alexandra Villaforte is a staff physician at the Center for Vasculitis Care and Research at the Cleveland Clinic. She is an associate professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome, Dr. Villaforte. We're so happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it's a very kind invitation. I'm honored to be here and speak to you about these drugs. Uh, my disclosure is just one. I'm a consultant for Amgen, but none of the talks today will include any drugs uh, by Amgen. So All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. It looks great. Perfect. So we'll be talking about IVIG therapy next. And again, my disclosure is I'm a consultant for Amgen. Uh, the same points that I'm making here as before, while different forms of vasculitis may share similar symptoms and treatment recommendation, each disease is distinct and each person with vasculitis is unique. Remember what works for one individual may not work for you. And it's important to develop a treatment plan that is right for you with a careful discussion with you and your physician and other providers um, in order to achieve success. All right, so what is intravenous immunoglobulin? As a very interesting medication, there's a lot to talk about it. We'll try to focus on the use of IVIG in vasculitis. It is basically a pool of human antibodies that is derived from blood, specifically the liquid part, the plasma, uh, on a multitude of donors. So it's a pool, so uh, it is treated uh, so that it doesn't carry infections. Uh, it is tested for infections before it's given, and uh, that's uh, the process of uh, making IVIG. Uh, it is very expensive and, and difficult, and so it is a, a, a very complicated drug. But it's been around for a while. Um, after World War II, and when it was used, uh, and, and, and it's a very interesting history of this medication, in 1951, it was first used to treat patients with primary immunodeficient disorders, improving the body ability to fight infections. So basically, it was noted that people who were either born or had acquired uh, immunodeficient disorders, meaning they could not fight infections, their immune system was deficient, that IVIG would give them this ability and uh, improve their uh, quality of life by decreasing the recurrence of infections, but also saved lives because uh, the, the main cause of death in these people was infections. And later on, 1983, we have the first report of the IVIG being used for the vasculitis Kawasaki disease. Uh, high doses of IVIG were given concurrently with aspirin therapy, and it was noted to be a life-saving uh, medication Kawasaki syndrome as it decreases uh, the um, complication of coronary aneurysm and also aneurysm in some other vessels. We don't know exactly when it was approved, but around some time after 1983. It is now available in many different brands. I'm just giving two examples here, but there are many. And uh, it is available intravenously and subcutaneously. Now, in the world of vasculitis, we more commonly use it intravenously, but for primary immunodeficiency, subcutaneous is taken over. Uh, it is very expensive. It depends on insurance approval. So sometimes intravenous is used for that reason. So what does this uh, IVIG do? It is the standard of care for the initial treatment of Kawasaki disease because it promotes reduction in the rate of coronary artery aneurysms and also in the duration of fever and other symptoms. 
uh, we expect that up to about 25% of kids with uh, Kawasaki disease may develop coronary aneurysm. So it is a very important complication. So it is a life-saving medication. Interestingly, the mechanism of action of IVIG in treated Kawasaki disease is unknown. The mechanism of action of IVIG is unknown for most of the diseases that it's used for, except for primary immunodeficiency. It's a complex drug. It works in many different ways, and we can't pinpoint on how it works for Kawasaki. But it appears to have a very generalized anti-inflammatory effect with effects in many different parts of the immune system. The dose that's commonly used is two grams per kilograms in a single day or single dose. Uh, it has also been used in divided dose in five days, but a single dose on the first day is preferable. IVIG is used in Kavazak with aspirin and should be started within the first 10 days of illness, ideally, within seven days if possible, uh, to achieve its outcome. However, if the diagnosis is missed, IVIG should still be given after the 10th day if there's persistent fever or signs of ongoing systemic inflammation, for example, elevated sedimentation rate or C-reactive protein. Side effects. Um, headache is the most common one. It's usually thought to be a result of the large volume of IVIG. IVIG comes in a very large uh, bag volume that needs to be given. It's given over many hours, usually a minimum of four or five hours. And the longer the duration, the less likely people will develop a headache or rarely even a stroke, which could happen, but is very rare. Uh, fatigue, nausea and vomiting, muscle and joint pain have been described on the day of the infusion. Uh, most people tolerate it well if we give it slow enough. Um, very rarely, it can uh, cause aseptic meningitis, which is symptoms of meningitis without an infection, uh, blood clots, or increased blood pressure. But headache is really the most common side effect, and that can be taken care of with pre-medication and increasing the number of hours that the medication is given. Who can be treated with IVIG? Well, in the world of vasculitis, the own vasculitis that has an FDA approved for that is Kawasaki disease. Other FDA-approved medications are listed here in the slides, but they are not vasculitis. Uh, some of them are autoimmune disease, some of primary immunodeficiency, leukemia, a specific type of leukemia, some autoimmune neurologic diseases. And an interesting point that I'd like to make here is that we sometimes we use IG, IVIG, but not to treat the vasculites, but in people who are being treated with, for example, rituximab that causes low IgG levels. So when do we consider using IVIG on people who are on rituximab, let's say every six months? That is when there are frequent infections. So not just the number, the level of the IgG. We monitor that in all patients taking rituximab and the level will be low in a high number of patients, but not everybody gets infections because of that low number. So the guidelines uh, and the recommendations in general is that we use the IVIG when people start having frequent infections, if that happens, not based on the low numbers of IgG alone. So what have we learned about IVIG since we started using it for Kavazak? These are very important points. The combination therapy. So children with Kavazaki that will be started on IVIG are also considered to have a combination therapy with corticosteroids if they have high risk of developing coronary aneurysm or resistant disease that are not responding to IVIG alone. Sometimes non-corticosteroid immunosuppressive agents are necessary in combination with the IVIG, either on high risk of developing aneurysm or those who are not responding to the IVIG. Some examples are infliximab, anacure, and cyclosporine. We normally do IVIG with the aspirin for all patients to reduce inflammation and prevent thrombosis if there is no contraindication to use it. So these are some of the resource, um, obviously the Vasculites Foundation, and I'm happy to answer any question. Um, 
I'll stop sharing now about IVIG. Okay, and thank you so much for educating us about IVIG, Dr. Villaforte. We have a couple of questions, but before we get to those questions, mm -hmm. I would love to know in the chat box if anybody would put in there if they're currently taking IVIG. We would like to give you, you know, a few seconds to do that. The chat box, if you don't see it, is in the lower corner. It usually is under more, or sometimes it's just a little blurb that says chat, little message box. We'll just see if we get any answers of anyone who's taking IVIG. Let's see. Oh, we are getting a few answers. Yep, there's a few people that are on it. Okay, thank you for letting us know this. Just a few, four people in this call so far that are on it. So it's interesting. Uh, well, I hope you all have some questions on it. The first question that did come up is, and we'll keep watching for to see if more people are on IVIG, but the first question that did come up is, what is the recommended dosing frequency for IGIV for patients that do benefit from it? Well, it depends on what is the reason we are using the IVIG. So let's say I'm making an assumption it is not a child that asked this question. So with Kawasaki, it's an adult. So IVIG that is being used because of a low IgG level and recurrent infections uh, is being given based on uh, the level of IgG and the, uh, the lowest amount that is needed to control the infection. Let me give some examples. We start out with monthly infusions, about 400 milligrams per kilogram approximately, and um, if that elevates the IgG levels to a close to normal level and the person stops having infections after a while, which varies, I mean, depends on each case, uh, it is really very individual. But let's say maybe three or four months after monthly infusions and no episodes of infections and the IgG levels are great, we might try to go every other month. I try to find the lowest amount of IVIG that keeps people from having infections, if possible, because that's the main reason why we're using the IVIG. And I I want to make obviously convenient. Going for a monthly infusion that is very long can be cumbersome. So if it's not necessary, I try to space it out. Okay, well, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, I was going to ask you, you sort of uh, edged on it there. I was going to ask you, is, is it used in pediatric Kawasaki? It is used in pediatric Kawasaki because it has to be used within 10 days of diagnosis in the acute illness. Okay. And um, that is the only FDA approval use of this medication at this point in time. Okay. I, I also did want to know, because I'm just not sure if I'm just not understanding it, but is the FDA only approving it for Kawasaki, a specific type of vasculitis, because it just hasn't been tested on others, or it, it just wouldn't be useful in others? Because it seems like if it would help hold off infection, that it might be useful in other forms of vasculitis? Um, I, I think there are many reasons why. One is the lack of studies. Secondly, and I'll, I'll go back to that because there's one study, a very old study in GPA, but uh, IVIG uh, is very poorly understood. We don't really know how it works. And even though we use for Kawasaki, we don't know how it works for Kawasaki exactly. Mm -hmm. So when you really lack uh, a minimal understanding, basic understanding on how the medication works, it's very difficult to do studies and choose which uh, diseases you would uh, apply that uh, clinical trial, let's say. So um, we don't have uh, any clinical trials uh, in, in other vasculitis, and you would require a very large number of patients. There are many other reasons, too. There are ethical reasons, too, because for some vasculitis, we have good medications and good treatment. Mm -hmm. So we're, we would consider maybe adding the IVIG, but we can't really test that against placebo, obviously, because that would be unethical. Uh, but... The IVIG has been used in the old days, really old days, 
I, I remember doing that in during my fellowship. That's how, as old as I am. But uh, that for, as a bridge, it was a very interesting idea that sometimes we faced before the advent of rituximab. So we rarely need that. But sometimes when people were very, very sick and not responding to a treatment, we tried to add IVIG as a bridge uh, and overlap with the second treatment that would, would start for about three months with hopes that that would allow us some control of the disease before the medication started working. So, you know, some of these medications we use in vasculitis, they take a while to start working, like rituximab. And so IVIG had been used as a bridge to try to uh, maintain the treatment going and that was a study that looked at that uh, many years ago in GPA and showed that there was some control and some improvement of GPA during three months, but not beyond that. So that was that why the idea came from that maybe it could be used as a bridge. Uh, we don't tend to do that anymore because we have so many other options. There are better mm -hmm. options now. So I, I can't remember doing that in, in many years. I feel like the first time I heard IVIG myself was during COVID. Was it more prevalent then? Because no, what, what happened, in, and I did that with some of my patients and, and, and during COVID, people who were on rituximab and had a very severe case of, uh, very severe case of uh, COVID and were hospitalized and were very sick and were given different treatments, but were noted because they were on rituximab to have an extremely low IgG, I did give them IVIG to sort of treat the COVID. But what I was trying to do and hoping to do was to improve and increase the levels of their IgG to help them fight that infection, especially because with COVID, there were other bacteria infections that complicated the case. So in there is no data to prove that that makes a difference. But when people were very sick in the hospital at times when their IgG was very low, sometimes IVIG was given. And these were patients on rituximab. Yeah, that makes perfect sense with what I was hearing now. I just couldn't remember. I just remember hearing it at the time. Okay, well, that, we don't have any other questions about IVIG. So I appreciate your educating us about IVIG. And um, thank you so much for your time on that. And um, I did want to say, just before we finish up today, I'm going to actually share my screen here and see if I can pick the correct screen. Nope, that's not it. There it is. And you should be seeing a uh, graphic about the Vasculitis Foundation website, because I just want to remind all patients before you finish up that our the Vasculitis Foundation website is where you can find all kinds of help and information about vasculitis. For instance, under the education tab, you can actually learn a little bit, bit, bit about all of the different forms of vasculitis and you can um, read about your form. You can go to the resources tab and under order print, you can find short documents that you can print out for family, or you could even take it to your primary care doctor's office, which is what I did just recently. I also took it to my dentist when I went to my dentist. I thought that was very helpful to him so he didn't have to look it up. Um, on the Vasculitis Foundation website, you'll also find a video library with all of the recorded webinars on the homepage. And you can find out more about the patient support groups, which are just an awesome asset to all patients. Upcoming events like live webinars, as well as Vasculitis Foundation conferences. And, uh, I, and I also did want to say just thank you so much to Dr. Alexandra Villaforte and, of course, to the Vasculitis Foundation for supporting us patients with these patient education webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was great to have you here. So thank you, everybody.